a three-hour drive north of Khartoum, the capital of Sudan. The Nubian Desert, an expanse of sand. On the edge of this inhospitable land, the dunes conceal unique remains. The Pyramids of Meroe, a UNESCO-listed World Heritage Site. So you can see if you stand here, you have the shape of V with all the pyramids behind. Sulima is one of the three official site guides. So this now, it's from uh, first century AD up to the third century AD. These pyramids housing tombs were built by the kingdom of Kush, a powerful Egyptian neighbor of the pharaohs. So they choose the higher place and they build their settlement. And then later on, they started to build their pyramids between. 200 years ago, artists decorated the tombs with finely carved bas-relief sculptures to accompany the resting place of the dead. This is like the most beautiful, well-preserved one. It's even wide and uh, you can see clearly all the offering and the things. Perfectly preserved sculptures, grandiose archaeological remains, and yet, we are entirely alone on the site. Although there are more pyramids in Meroe than in the whole of Egypt, not a single tourist lurks on the horizon. In the stifling heat, camel drivers desperately await the unlikely arrival of a group of travelers. And the reason for the lack of visitors? Sudan is now being run by a military junta. It's really sad. I mean, really sad. It, it's a greed. I think they just think about themselves and they leave the country. You know, it's uh, this is the tourism. It's only one thing. This is could improve improve the the country because since you land, there is a money going there. Yeah. To the taxi, to the yeah, hotels, yeah, to the sure. market. The money they collected as a site here, you pay with dollars. <laughs> Four years ago. Sudan welcomed 200,000 tourists a year. But since the military took over the government, the country has been close to tourists. In the heart of the desert, the pyramids and temples are gradually fading into oblivion. On the shores of the Red Sea, the shimmering seabed that once attracted divers from all over the world is also deserted. The diving clubs have closed their doors and nothing can disturb the silence of the country. Now one of the most isolated in the world. Located south of Egypt, Sudan is one of the largest countries in Africa. It's also one of the most unstable. It even holds a sad record. The country that has experienced the most coup attempts in Africa, 18 since its independence in 1956. The 44 million Sudanese people have experienced 30 years of dictatorship under the military Islamist regime of Omar al-Bashir. On the 25th of October 2021, a new coup d'etat brought General al-Buahan and his military junta to power. Since then, the civilian population has been fighting for democracy. We took a trip to this besieged country. In order to prevent the demonstration from spreading, the forces of law and order monitor movements to control the inhabitants. The revolutionaries, on the other hand, are setting up barricades. Every weekend, thousands of Sudanese people clash with the police, demanding the departure of the military. We don't escape. Revolution to the end. Facing life ammunition. The young people have only their bravery and some makeshift equipment. This is the Dereka. The Dereka is a small army. The Dereka is a small army. The Dereka is a small army. We accompanied the revolutionaries during the biggest demonstration against the regime. In the midst of clashes with the police and the army, to break the resistance, the junta even uses rape 
as a war weapon. Some of the children who went to this police station, they complain about uh, attempts of uh, sexual abuse. As the country descends into chaos, the economy is collapsing. To get by, over two million Sudanese people have left the cities to find their fortune in the desert. Turn like this, it will be one grams. From the dunes of Nubia to the suburbs of Khartoum, let's dive into a country trying its hardest to turn a new page in its history. We are in Bahari, in the northern suburbs of Khartoum. As she does every morning, Hinda is saying her prayers. <laughs> Diving into the sacred texts. But the 32-year-old isn't just a hard-working student. Every day she swaps her veil and abaya for a football kit and trainers, because Hinda is the captain of the Sudanese national football team. Women's football in Sudan is still in its infancy. In this patriarchal Muslim country, Sharia law has long been the rule. Fortunately, Hinda can count on her landlady's support. She houses her for free in exchange for some housework. When she's not playing for the national team, Hinda joins her teammates for training. They meet on this vacant lot next to the airport. The girls might be part of the Al Tahadi team, the best in the country, but they have no resources and can't afford to train in a real field. <laughs> With an annual budget of 400 euros, the team can't afford any luxuries. Even the goalposts aren't up to standard. They're just pipes welded together. That the players install in the dust at the start of every training session. Stops, dribbles, passes. Hinda and her teammates are doing their exercises. The only spectators are a few goats, disturbed in their search for food among the rubbish. Hmm. 
الموجود علينا انه احنا ما عندنا ميزانيه كون احنا ناجرين لنا ملعب الملاعب هنا اغلبيتها عندنا بقروش اقل ملعب انت بتاجره ب 10000 حلو الباص The real stadium that Hinda dreams of is just 200 meters away from their vacant lot. Today it's occupied by a men's team, but they only play in the fourth division. Their coach is familiar with the Al Tahadi captain's background. <laughs> علي العيني انظري على التمرين شوفي اللاعب منو الملعب كل حاجه لكن لا حسب اجيب تقعد ولا في كسر اه مشكله اه مذكره سلت على الكور ايوه صح اي أيوة والله اي فعلا لا مشكله تبعد انسى انا بس ان شاء الله بترجع هذه اظن ما في مشكله الظروف مع الناس if mentalities are slowly changing in sudan it's because the country has been living under sharia law for 30 years Islamic law was imposed by the dictator Umar al bashir He came to power in 1989 and has ruled the country with an iron fist ever since. Despite his jovial appearance and his famous dance steps, Umar al bashir is ruthless towards his opponents and stifles his people. Under his undisputed rule, men weren't shy about flogging women in public for dressing too lightly. His military Islamic regime even became a refuge for the most wanted international terrorists, including Osama bin Laden. Or Carlos, who can be seen in these images, enjoying a carefree life in Khartoum. Omar el Bashir is also accused by the International Criminal Court of War Crimes and Genocide for his role in the war in Darfur, which has left over 300,000 people dead and 3 million displaced. In 2018, his power was shaken by food riots. Women were at the forefront of this popular revolution, making up over 60% of the demonstrators. <laughs> The dictatorship was finally overthrown in April 2019. A transitional government was then set up. For the first time in decades, the Sudanese people got a taste of freedom and democracy. Women were the big winners of the revolution. The new government put an end to Sharia law. Floggings and female genital mutilation were banned. Sudanese women could now remove their veils, wear trousers and dance. But in the end, their freedom was short-lived. In October 2021, General al Buahan was brought to power by a coup. The new ruler of Sudan, al Buahan, chased the civilians out of government and seized the revolution. نحن كقوات مسلحة لسنا طرف نحن حريصين على حاجة واحدة وحدة السودان. The number of arbitrary arrests soon increased. So, to safeguard their hard-won democracy, the Sudanese people organized resistance committees. In Omdurman, a few kilometers northwest of Khartoum, the resistance headquarters were established in this disused school. <laughs> By writing these messages on the walls, the women risk prison and torture. The members of the resistance committee know that the demonstration on Thursday will be fiercely suppressed, so they're preparing to defend themselves with whatever resources they can find. 
دي از الدرجه الدرجه دي مصنوعه من الاغطيه بتاعت البراميل بتاعت الجاز آه بتتقلع وبعد ذاك بتتعمل على يد من الحديد الحاجات دي كلها عاملينها نحن برانا بتصنع يدويا غير الدرجه دي في برميل كامل بتقسم على نصين البرميل ده بيحميك من من فوق لتحت يعني Their equipment is somewhat pathetic. Simple plastic helmets faced with live ammunition from the military. Makeshift armor doesn't prevent resistance fighters from being shot at by the junta. Since the beginning of the demonstrations on the 25th of October 2021, 119 demonstrators have been killed. In Khartoum, they are considered the martyrs of the revolution, and their portraits are displayed proudly across the walls of the city. Every neighborhood mourns the death of at least one of its children. This is the Mahmoud. محمود الامير ود من سكان الحي استشهد يوم فضل الاعتصام يوم 30 6 يوم 3 6 صح يوم فضل الاعتصام يوم فضل الاعتصام القياده فالمدرسه دي اتسمت باسمه لانه يعني كان شاب يعني ما في زيه اثنين شاب مناضل ما بتخاف ما بتخاف اي يعني واحد بيطلع واحد بيطلع بيشوف دموم او بشيء صاحبه صاحبه ميت بيكون شايل يعني خلاص يعني حتى احنا ضميرنا مات يعني بيقع عادي يعني دموم وشارع وبمار ناس يعني شوفنا شوفنا بلاوي مصايف في السورة دي احنا يعني خلاص كترت كترت قلبنا Khartoum, the capital, is at the forefront of the demonstration. This city of five million inhabitants in the middle of the desert is the hottest capital in the world, measuring at least 40 degrees for more than half the year. It was built in the 19th century at the meeting point of the Blue and White Niles. Khartoum is the birthplace of the Nile, which flows through Sudan to Egypt. The Khartoum agglomeration stretches along the riverbanks. The streets are often made of mud and lined by brick houses. Khartoum is known for its lively market with hundreds of stalls selling everything, from kilos of henna powder to mountains of dates. The city also has a modern district with several glass and steel towers, including the iconic al Fateh, home to a luxury hotel. This district full of opulent buildings is where the country's bourgeoisie live. This is where Radio Mariud is located a private radio station promoting Sudanese cultural life. On 103 FM, there is no mention of politics, but you can find programs on Sudanese art, music, and young creators, far from the harsh and regressive line of the military power. Oh good, oh good. Today's guest is Ibrahim Snoopy Ahmed, one of the hottest Sudanese directors of the moment. Recently, in Khartoum, there was a lot of Sudan and European films, and there was a lot of films that I mean. There was a lot of Sudan that was in He has won several awards for his dramas and documentaries, and was recently invited to the Cannes Film Festival. Even with the hard times that we are in right now, but uh, the artistic scene is still rising, maybe slower than last year, but it's surely getting somewhere. So uh, I'm sure that uh, in the next few years, we will see new talents, new perspectives. But for the last few months, Snoopy has moved away from the set. Now he works in the streets. The 33-year-old videographer has set himself the task of documenting the abuses committed by the military regime. This morning, he's preparing to film at the heart of the demonstration. He knows that today's planned rally, the largest since the uprising began, could turn into a bloodbath. 
Batteries, you know, you need a lot of batteries on a day like this. You can't just charge in the middle of the protest. To discourage people from participating in the rallies, the regime is using every means at its disposal. This morning, everyone in Khartoum received a text message from the Ministry of Defense, and the message was clear. You will be using excessive force, you know, tear gas, uh, sticks, you know, handcuffs, uh, four wheel, and then uh, water trucks. In fact, they just killed more people. So it's not a surprise that we find that today, you know, killing us, you know, and especially photographers like me or videographers, they are the ones that mostly targeted because we are the ones that, you know, uh, the eyes of the, the streets and also exposing what they're doing. To stop the whole world from seeing the crackdown, the military has imposed a total blackout. The telephone network has been blocked since 8 o'clock this morning, and the internet is completely cut off throughout the country. But Snoopy is ready to take any risk to inform the international community. Every time we go to the protest, we risk our lives. You know, even like today, I might not make it at the end of the day. But that's not how we think. We think that we risk our life in order for other people to live a healthy life, you know, with more freedom, with more, uh, you know, democracy. On the 30th of June, hundreds of thousands of people are expected to take to the streets of Khartoum. This is the biggest demonstration in eight months of clashes. So today, the people of Sudan hope they'll finally succeed in overthrowing the junta. In every neighborhood, processions are coming together to meet at the presidential palace. On the main roads, protesters are building barricades with whatever they can find. Cinder blocks, bricks, everything that can be used to slow the process of the forces of order and protect the neighborhood's inhabitants from attacks by the military and the police. In the neighboring streets, tasks are split between the inhabitants. Young or old, rich or poor, everyone participates. The women are making sandwiches in a line. These will be given out to demonstrators for free. How many people you feed? Uh, around four to five thousand every day. We're trying for change, we're going for it, and we're not stopping to move. We have this change. The procession is moving. The demonstrators equip themselves. Some put on gas masks. Others are content with a mere scarf, swimming goggles or construction masks. Confrontation with the police is imminent. To prevent demonstrators from the suburbs of Khartoum from reaching the city center, the military has blocked the bridges. They've placed containers across the road, but they won't be able to resist the uncontrollable crowd for long. As they approach the official buildings, the first tear gas canisters fall on Snoopy and his comrades. The presidential palace is only a few dozen meters away. The police decide to throw their water cannons into the crowd. 
Then the situation starts to get out of hand and the army starts firing out live ammunition. In the front line, a young man has just been shot in the shoulder. The bursts mow through the ranks of demonstrators. The victims are evacuated on makeshift stretchers. Despite the government's stronghold over the hospitals, the emergency services continue to help the wounded, but they're quickly overwhelmed. The clashes continue through the night. Despite their rocks, plastic helmets and makeshift shields, the hundreds of thousands of demonstrators weren't enough to sway the junta. In the early hours of the morning, the toll was high, nine dead and over 5,000 injured. The military arrested a 1,000 people, but Snoopy managed to escape the trap. After a night of chaos, he checks for news about his loved ones. Yeah, man. <laughs> أنا ما أعرف جات وين ذات ولا كيف ولا طحمة الموكب دا عرفته بس شنو كويس إنه مرقنا منه. يا ما الحمد لله الحمد لله نقدر نطلع لأنه الموضوع ده كان صعب شديد صعب شديد ناس كتير يتعودوا. بالضبط كده والناس يا أخي ماتوا كم زي ثمانية أنفار صح؟ تسعة ليلة حصلوا تسعة ليلة. أوكي أوكي. يلا. سنوبي doesn't know any of the victims this time, but in just a year he's lost eight of his friends. You know you get used to it. You know, the fact that you will be losing someone, so you have always some expectation that you lose someone. Uh, you can meet someone in the, in the protest, and the next thing you know, at night he's dead. So that can be you know, a little bit, you know, sad and frustrating, but we move on. There's nothing to do. After the demonstration, we go to Al Jafda Hospital in the center of Khartoum. This is where most of the injured were evacuated. All the wards are full so consultations are taking place right on the steps. In the capital, the hospitals are now under military control. We can't film inside, but one of the doctors agreed to talk to us about her daily life. Dr. Z is an emergency doctor. She has been on the front lines since the riots began. I've seen dead people I dealt with. I wouldn't say victims, I would say survivors. Many people lost their eyes, got paralyzed, ended up with fractures. Uh. It's impossible for Dr. Z to treat them properly. I have a knowledge in my, high, in my head, but I can't apply it because there is lack of materials, there is lack of, of tools, there is lack of everything. Healthcare is far from being a priority for the junta. It devotes less than 2% of its GDP to health spending compared to 80% for military spending. The armed forces regularly assault doctors. I've been attacked myself. The military forces attacked the hospital inside. They threw tear gas inside the hospital. Everyone was suffocating and looking for some air. And they've seen me suturing the wound. And they grabbed me from my white coat. And they start shouting at me. And at some point, they hit me, they beat me, but I never stop. <laughs> Despite the beatings and the threats, Dr. Z doesn't hesitate to treat the wounded at the heart of the demonstrations, like many of her colleagues. I got out of purple here. I've been beaten twice. I dislocated my shoulder once. And yeah, that's it. I think I'm pretty lucky. I'm really lucky, I feel lucky. I mean, Dr. Babikir was a colleague. He was doing the same thing I was doing, and he ended up with a bullet in his chest. I mean, it's the price for freedom, and I'm ready for that, whatever it takes. 
Because they're direct witnesses to the atrocities committed by the regime, health workers are in the military sites. Salima is a psychologist. She risks her life every day by continuing her consultations here at the Afat Trauma Center. This small organization fighting to continue its existence receives around 500 patients per year, women and children who are victims of severe psychological trauma. Assalamu alaikum. Kaifkum kwaisin? Tamam? These are two rooms for uh, private consultations and also for adults, as the child corner is there. Solima receives battered women or children in psychological distress. And for the past few months, the majority of her patients are victims of the junta. Those are the people in uniform who are supposed to protect are uh, attacking the people within the protest. It's part of uh, dispersing the protest, also violating the people, not just killing or uh, hitting them, but also sexually violating them. Some of the children who went to this police station, they complain about uh, attempts of uh, sexual abuse, uh, the boys and the girls, the boys especially. We saw cases of children who actually lost uh, because of the, the, the heavy sexual trauma that happened to them. They already uh, regretted to very small age. Like she's nine, but she cannot walk. They have to carry her. And she cannot speak. She, she completely did not speak again. I was already exposed to be investigated and facing very serious uh, crimes like spying, uh, jeopardizing the constitutional law, which actually could reach to even um, death penalty. Yes, Cheers. for just doing my job. I was just doing my job. The files are piling up in the center's drawers. Once Sudan regains peace, Salima hopes she can bring those responsible before a court of justice and have them sentenced for their crimes. For decades, Sudan has been wrecked by wars, insurgencies and coups. The country has long been under the control of the Islamic politics of the Muslim Brotherhood, a strict vision of Islam championed by Umar el bashir But since the dictator's fall, another religious current has been gained strength, Sufism. For centuries, this mystical Islamic practice has permeated Sudanese society. The Sufi brothers advocate a peaceful spirituality and closeness with God. Every Friday evening in the suburbs of Khartoum, hundreds of men gather at the tomb of Sheikh Hamid al-Nil, a well-respected 19th century cleric. For many hours, the dervishes sway, twist and dance. Some sing and go into a trance sometimes until sunset. Today, the country is preparing to celebrate the biggest festival of the year. The mosques are packed full for Eid al-Adha, the festival of sacrifice. There are so many believers that in some neighborhoods, the preaching is taking place directly on the streets. Men and women are dressed in their best clothes for the holy day. Abdallah is wearing his jalabiya, a traditional outfit for the occasion. In Umduaman, Abdallah can't take one step without being greeted by locals. <laughs> The cotton importer and exporter, Abdallah, is the perfect example of societal success for the neighborhood's inhabitants. He grew up there and knows all about their local traditions. All the children, they visit uh, all the house here in this hood. All this house, they have the lamb and they are uh, have the sacrifice, this lamb today. In memory of Ibrahim's sacrifice, it's tradition for each household to kill a sheep and eat it. Abdallah's family may live in one of the wealthiest houses in the neighborhood. 
But even for them, celebrating the holiday is becoming increasingly difficult. Yeah, uh, that's my family. Uh, that's my aunt. Uh, his name is uh, Ilham. Abdallah's aunt sees prizes rising every day. In one year, inflation has reached a record high of 380 percent. Abdallah and his family bought this sheep for almost 200 euros, a huge expense in Sudan, as the average salary is just 40 euros a month. So Ilham is filling up little bags to share the meat with the poor. حاجات بتاعتنا اللي احنا بنعملها عادة في عيد الضحية يعني تزول بيطلع جزء للأسرة للبيت وللضيوف اللي بيجوا وجزء بيكون دائما للجيران للناس اللي ما قد ما كان عندهم إمكانية إنهم يجيبوا خروف أو إنهم يضحوا فبالتالي. In Sudan, meal preparation is a predominantly female activity. The men have therefore deserted the kitchen to rest in the living room. A division of roles that Ilham accepts based on one key philosophy. <laughs> After three hours of cooking, the grilled mutton is finally ready to be eaten. We come now to enjoy with this beautiful uh, meal. A delicious meal on a holy day, a scene that's likely to become increasingly rare. The UN estimates that soon, almost one in two Sudanese people will go hungry. The country's economy is slowing down. Since the civil war that saw South Sudan seceded in 2011, Sudan has lost its main source of income, the oil wells. Since the junta came to power in 2021, the situation has worsened. The country has been ostracized by the international community. Trade has dropped and the US and the World Bank have suspended hundreds of millions of euros in aid. The United States condemns the actions taken overnight by Sudanese military forces. In light of these developments, the United States is pausing assistance from the $700 million in emergency assistance appropriations of economic support funds for Sudan. So to escape poverty, more and more people have decided to seek their fortunes in the middle of the desert. As they move away from Khartoum, strange settlements emerge from the landscape. At the edge of the road, thousands of tents have been built amidst the stones and sand dunes. No infrastructure and no town for miles. The men living here are gold diggers. There are already two million of them crossing the Nubian desert because Sudan is set to be the home of the second largest gold reserve on the African continent. Two years ago, Mohammed gave up his job in tourism to walk the sand in search of the golden nugget that would change his life. Sometimes you will find, you know, like a half of this. Mohammed has put together a small team. A dozen men dig alongside him. He gives them detectors, lodging and food, in exchange for a set allowance. Mohammed and his comrades share their findings. And in the last few days, they've been quite lucky. Hey, good, huh? Yeah. Is it almost one gram now? Uh, one gram and half. Half a gram? Yes. It's not one day, it's like three days. Three days? Yes. Gold diggers earn an average of 300 euros a month, seven times the salary of a doctor in Sudan. 
but it's a hard life. <laughs> Mohammed and his team work tirelessly for a month. They're housed in a communal tent with little to no comfort. They sleep with a simple sheet on the floor and pass the time with a little horse game. They live a monastic life in the hope that this golden dust will free them from poverty. Sometimes you come here and you work for a month and you go home without nothing, zero. Oh. Some people, they come here, they have nothing. And then he come back and rich, he buy a lot of car, a lot of machine, a lot of house, and he become a rich man. Yeah, good. The men who have been lucky enough to find their fortune are located just a few hundred meters away from Mohammed's camp. Here, resources have nothing to do with it. The process is almost industrialized. So this is the machine that we will put in the floor, oh, wait, wait, wait. up, okay, and then uh, the gold, and we come down here, okay. It's become some uh, floors with a, with a mix with the gold, okay, and then they take it out and they go in the midday, they will wash it, and then uh, they will take the gold outside. You don't need permission to dig in the desert. So a real gold rush is going on at the moment. One Sudanese man in 20 is now hunting for nuggets in the 45 degree heat, hoping to find the new El Dorado. All the people, uh, they have a dream, you know, because here is not like uh, a job in the company or uh, in the Parma or in anything, or driver. Here you have dreams. But Nearly 100 tons of gold were extracted from Sudanese soil in 2021, 80% of which was mined in artisanal operations like Mohammed's. This shiny yellow metal has become the country's main source of income. Most of it is exported abroad, but the rest is sold in shops like these. The resale of gold is one of the only businesses not to suffer from the crisis. <laughs> The Sudanese people are flocking to it because gold has become a safe haven. Because of inflation, bundles of banknotes might soon be worth nothing at all. The country is teetering on the edge of economic bankruptcy. In the streets of the capital, Khartoum's five million inhabitants are trying to survive by working small jobs. Some sell their meager incense production in the markets. Others transport ice cream on their bikes. Even children are leaving school to bring home a few bucks. Among the women, a new business corporation has taken over the pavements of Khartoum. These women are known as tea ladies, tea sellers. In the Al Sayana neighborhood, Amira has been working as a tea seller for four years. Every day at precisely 4 p.m. here on the corner of Sahafa Avenue, Amira sets up her coal stove, three plastic chairs, and does a quick sweep. In a few minutes, her temporary cafe is ready to welcome its first customers. There are 8,000 tea ladies in the streets of Khartoum, just like Amira. Customers come from all over the neighborhood for her special recipe. Uh, 
The customers will be sipping their coffees until 3 a.m. Amira will have earned around 1 euro 50 for 12 hours working in the dust and smoke. It's the next morning in a working class neighborhood in the north of Khartoum. It's eight o'clock and Amira is already hard at work. She has a whole household to manage. Since her divorce, Amira has returned home to live with her parents. There are two rooms and a dirt yard to fit everyone. A makeshift set up in the courtyard and it's the same in the kitchen. There are some pots and pans, but the young mother can't even heat them up. At 50 euros a bottle, Amira can't afford it, especially as she's just gone into debt to buy a new fridge. Amira hasn't unpacked it yet because she has to get her roof fixed first. A few meters away from the cartoon stadium, football player Hinda is in full preparation mode. Tonight, her team, Al Tahadi, will face its runner up, the formidable Al Matfadgia team. Despite the stress of the match, Hinda and her teammates are having a last moment of relaxation. They're discussing game strategy and equipment. <laughs> The shoe saleswoman offers the girls the latest model. After some hesitation, Hinda finally gives in and tries them on. But for Hinda, who doesn't earn any money as a female football player, the price is exorbitant. Not only are they expensive, but there's an extra detail bothering Hinda. She finds that the shoes are much too stiff for her taste. But the time for haggling is over. It's 30 minutes before the start of the match and Mahdi, the team's coach, is going over the basics. The Al Tahadi Al Matfadgia derby begins. At kickoff, the stands are sparse with around 30 supporters overall. The boys on one side and the girls on the other. Some of them want to be on the pitch themselves, like this medical student. I'm so happy to, say, to see the girl play here and uh, uh, their family make him do, the, do, do it without anything. So if I'm here, I think my 
uh, those girls, they're lucky. Yeah. But I'm not. <laughs> So sad. Sorry. Hinda and her teammates quickly scored their first goal before taking the field. The girls from Al Matfadgia are behind. At the end of the 90 minutes, the score is clear. Al Tahadi wins 11 0. Thanks to this brilliant victory, the players will receive a match bonus, cash handed out directly to them when they leave the stadium. But it's far from a Western bonus. Tonight, they get an equivalent of 87 cents, barely enough for a taxi ride home. <laughs> Hinda and her team are leading the women's league. But the Al Tahadi captain has another dream in mind to take part in the 2027 World Cup. Sudan, on the other hand, is seeking deeper into a crisis every day. Men and women continue to protest every week, demanding the end of the junta. After more than 30 years of dictatorships, the country isn't ready to give up its dream of democracy yet. <laughs> 